Morning. Morning, great to uh, see you all here this morning uh, in the sanctuary. Get to see some old faces. Am I allowed to say that Curtis looks old? I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's great to see. Um, it's great to see him and Elaine here this morning with their kids, all uh, two and a half of them. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit from them later in the service. It's brilliant. For those of you at home in your worship spaces behind that little green dot beneath the camera in the back wall, Welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have you join uh, in with us this morning. It's a lovely morning. Looking forward to actually worshiping together this morning. So as we've been doing the whole way through the pandemic, I invite you at home, as we are going to do here, to light that candle as that symbol, that light that we are together uh, in this place gathered to worship. And the Lord is with us wherever you are in your worship spaces. So let's light those candles together. And it's a pleasure this morning to have the uh, youth band. I don't know whether I can actually claim to be part of it at my age, but uh, it's great to have them. And they're going to come and lead us this morning. So as they come, that's it. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Anime uh, to lead us in, in prayer this morning. So let's, let's worship together. word we find purpose in your presence we find light and joy you are the source of peace and hope for all who turn to you in the difficult times of isolation and distance from each other you have remained faithful and near to us you have been our help our guide and our only hope thank you lord you are a good father you give us strength and courage when we face challenges in you we find rest and welcome along the way. We praise you, loving Father, for your steadfast love. Draw near to us once more in this time of worship. Open our ears and hearts to hear your word and to be transformed by your spirit. As we come together, we think of the people of Ukraine and all of those who are in need in the world. As we worship, create in us a compassionate heart that glorifies you and follows your ways. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and join us in worship. <laughs> There's some actions in this song in the chorus, so feel free to follow along.
Okay, this is a new song uh, that we're going to do, I think, well, probably for the first time this morning. Is that right, Daniel? So, let's see how we do it. You guys are going to go down to Sunday school now with Ham, yeah? Yeah. 
Well, we're gonna, you're going to fall palm down into the lines. Let me pray for you just before you head down. Let's pray for the kids. Lord, we just thank you for these uh, kids that are here this morning. Pray blessing on them now as they go down into the lines into Sunday school, Lord, that, um, that you would just go with them and you would move in their midst and that they would learn about you this morning. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So the kids are heading down. Remind, reminder to all parents of children and children and uh, youth that Camp Douglas, uh, the registration is open for that. Camp Douglas, if you just go to campdouglas.ca, you'll see the camp dates for the summer. Uh, all the registration information is there. Highly recommend it. Pretty certain it's going to be Daniel's last year with Camp Douglas pretty certain. So uh, he's going to be the director for the entire time this summer, so I would highly recommend you, you uh, uh, register your kids for that. I'm going to hand over to Kathleen. She's going to lead us in prayer. God of hope, when the world is confusing and frustrating, you bring light and hope. We pray this day for those who are in pain and suffering, for the ones who are in despair. Merciful God, give us hope in this time. God of peace, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for the innocents who are suffering violence. We pray especially for the children, protect them. We pray for those who face loss and hardship in these uncertain times, and all who know sorrow and suffering. God of mercy, we pray for understanding and peace. We pray for diplomacy to end conflicts and threats not only in Ukraine, but also among all the nations. We hope with humble hearts that your kingdom come. God of community and compassion, we thank you for your steadfast presence. Bless our congregation and every church that is struggling. Inspire us to consider renewed ministry and mission after months of restricted gatherings. Reawaken our love for one another and our desire to worship and serve together in Jesus' name. We pray also for those who need your healing. You know Wood, Louise Renard, Janice Darlington, Helen Arnett, Ron Edwards, Liz Lilly, Lauren Dennis, Kel Kaiser, and Penny McDonald. We pray also for our friends in senior facilities, Margaret Williams, Don Campbell, Ian Bone, Joanne Graham, and Dean Scott. God of grace, receive these prayers and the unspoken prayers of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we pray, amen. Thanks, girls, for uh, leading us this morning. And um, welcome to the youth band, Bertie, the, who played the piano this morning. Great to have you. Um, I'm going to invite Curtis to come up and join me at the front. Oh, look, Daniel, thanks very much. Uh, Curtis is aging, he needs a seat. Not just a minute. Morning, buddy. Morning. Is your mic working? Has it, has it got a green light? I got the green light. You've got the off. famous green light. Am I allowed to take that off? Uh, absolutely. Yeah? Okay. We want to see your face. <gasps> uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, this is Curtis Wilson. Curtis, uh, uh, I used to be youth, Curtis's youth pastor at Fairview Presbyterian when his dad was the minister there. Then I got the call here in 2008, and uh, so I went looking for Curtis and brought Curtis here uh, to be our youth pastor for, I can't remember now, number of years. Three or four. Three or four. And then through that time, uh, Curtis and Elaine um, got, uh, well, they were already, you were already married by that stage, I think. Yep. And then you were going through training to become ministers in the denomination. And then you flew across the country to go to a little place somewhere in, called Ontario. Something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Kingston? Kingston. So you've been there for how many years? Six. Wow. I know. You really are getting old. I am. And uh, so you've been kind of joint pastoring in Kingston. And since you've been to Kingston, you now have two and a half kids. So the, the yep. two that are... And a dog. And a dog. We'll yep. not talk about the dog. Uh, <laughs> the, so the two kids that are here this morning, tell us ages, names. Yeah. So uh, we have Gemma. She is five and Kalia is two and a half. Two and a half. And then Elena, uh, you're both, well, you're expecting that number three to come. Baby three comes at the end of May. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So why are you in Vancouver? We are in Vancouver, uh, one, because of the food. Um, what have you missed the most? Oh, the li how long do you have? The, the list is too long. It's, yeah. <laughs> and so far, we have, we've been binging as much Asian food as we can. 
Um, so a lot of sushi. Uh, we had hot pot uh, not too long ago. And the hot pot place had a robot. Do you know I've which just was like I've had that, just that memory that I thought I had eradicated from my head when you took me, was it you took me once and we had to have a... Yeah, you had chicken feet oh, for the first time. Chicken feet. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I thought I had... Oh, yeah. I think I've offended a bunch of people right now. <laughs> I, I just, I'm sorry, but I just, I'm Irish. I can't he, do he that. He doesn't do chicken feet. No. Anyway. Yeah. So, and you missed the chicken feet? Uh, no, we haven't had chicken feet since we were here. No. But uh, a lot of Shanghainese food, noodles, dumplings, great stuff. Oh, so, okay. So you're in Vancouver for the food. Yeah. That's not the whole trip. That's and not the whole the trip. Okay, no, so. we are actually in the process of moving back to BC uh, because we have received a call to St. Giles Presbyterian in Prince George. Oh. Uh, so we're heading awesome. up north. Yeah. Awesome. When does that start? Uh, so we fly up to, to Prince George on Friday, uh -huh. and we officially start April 1st. April 1st. Oh. Just in time for Easter. Just in time for April Fool's Day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, absolutely <laughs> awesome. So actually up there at the minute we've got, uh, is a, so Al and you, a buddy of ours, because uh, Alan used to be at uh, Coquitlam Presbyterian. Al's up in Prince George, kind he of is. minister in association or associate pastor or Yeah, something? he's a minister in association, so right. he's been kind of helping out the interim moderator, who also happens to be from, formerly from this presbytery, Presby, yeah. uh, Emery Kazi. Yeah. Um, and so he's, he's kind of the, the minister on the ground, and he's been helping getting things ready and settled for, for this transition that they have. So I think he's looking forward to a, a great vacation. After, okay, so you're, uh, you're transitioning stuff. through the two of you to your next call. You're doing, yeah. it's a full-time call between the two of you, just like what you had yeah, in Yeah, so like in, in Kingston, Kingston, it's one full-time position that we're splitting 50-50, uh, which confuses a lot of people, and it's okay because it confuses us as well. Um, but we make it work, and, uh, and we'll continue to make it work out there. So. Awesome. Yeah. Curtis, um, since obviously we've seen you last, the world, as you can see, everything has dramatically changed. A sea of uh, masks yeah. still in existence. So we've had or in still in the midst of this pandemic. How has it been in Kingston for you guys over yeah. the past couple of years? Yeah, Kingston was really hard. Um, we had a, a few more, I think we've had a few more lockdowns than, than here in, in Vancouver. So we, we had a brief time, um, I think in the summer, where, where we were able to be back in building. And then there was another lockdown. So we went all back online and and just kind of tried to, to do a bit of a hybrid. Um, one thing that I think COVID has taught a lot of church leaders and taught myself is that the idea of online church is not going away anytime soon, that there is going to be, moving forward, there's going to be this hybrid idea of church, which I'm not tech, um, like against technology at all. I love it. Um, I try and keep up with it as much as I can. Um, but when I heard the term uh, online church, <laughs> something within me just cringed and I think part of my brain broke a little bit because I just couldn't map out exactly how that would work. Um, but I've, I've come to realize just this, it, it, it's not something that's gonna go away and, so it's not, and it's also not something that we need to fear. I think that there is room for the wide reach that the online world has that we can, you know, Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations, and all nations is wherever people are. People are online. So that is a mission field that is ripe yeah. for engaging in. But there are some things that online will not be able to replicate, just as in person will not be able to replicate the same kind of reach that online has. And so we need both of these, these arenas working together um, and so how that relationship works and what it's going to look like that's something that we have the privilege of figuring out and helping the future church kind of build off of but it'll take it'll take mature and thoughtful and spirit discerning disciples to figure out exactly how is that going to work so that we can reach as many people for Jesus and tell this amazing news that we have um, to as many people as possible, and then be able to still grow within relationship. 
Sorry, you get two preachers up here with mics. It's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave <laughs> no, it at that. No, and we didn't rehearse this. I'm kind of going, oh, no. this is awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying, Curtis, because it's really, it's really hard as a church leader to mm. basically stand before a group of people and encourage them to come and listen to you preach, because mm. right? that's basically what you're mm. doing, but also at the same time to say, look, I get the fact that we have this opportunity to do online and we have been blessed with the technology over the past mm. years. Like, I, I can't imagine going through this pandemic without the technology. Mm. But now that we're kind of at this stage, I re like, I've been encouraging people. I think we have to get back together because we have lost that sense of what does it mean to be the gathered mm. mm -hmm. people. We've been gathering virtually, but to actually gather. And we're still not there yet. We're not yeah. fellowshipping um, after church. We're not really getting to talk to each other and find out what's been going on. We're not really doing it fully yet and really just kind of allow ourselves a bit of time, a bit of patience, but eventually get there, that we are yearning to be together and learn together and grow together again, which mm -hmm. would, would, would be kind of my, uh, m my sense of what I'd really like to see happening in the church. Right. Um, so um, it, just in terms of like, what have you seen happening um, in the church, right, from your experience now in Ontario and in around Kingston, kind of like pre-pandemic to what if we, I know we can't use the word post-pandemic because we're not there. We yeah. might never be there right. just because of the shape of it. Yeah. But where we're at now, like what's your sense of what's happened within kind of the, the larger body and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the language that we've been using for the pandemic is um, the difference between um, an interruption into our lives and a disruption. An interruption is something that is, it's momentary. It, it, it has a beginning and an ending and then life kind of continues on the way it was before. Um, but a disruption is what I think God has been using the pandemic. And that is, it's, it's a moment where our lives are kind of rattled and, and shaken up where a lot of the idols and the comforts that we had are kind of exposed for what they are. And we're left, um, Eugene Peterson uses the word esthesis, and he, he, um, he follows the, the Jonah story that Jonah's time in the great fish was this time of esthesis. It was a, uh, either a voluntary or, or kind of forced because of circumstance um, place of confinement where the only thing you can do is turn to God in prayer. That there's nothing left you can do. You are stripped of, of all control, there's no human way of moving oh forward, God. and yeah. you just say, God, what do we do here? Where do I go? And, and it's, it's an opportunity I think God has given the church where um, I, I think, the, in a way, the idea of, of the Christian faith just being a Sunday morning thing is, is that's long gone and has been lit on fire, like way back there. Like there, you, can't, you can't do that anymore. And, and the pandemic has just kind of, um, accelerated any any of the churches that may have that kind of culture have found that um, people have used this now as an excuse just not to come back and so um, attendance is down budgets are down and people are congregations are, are experiencing what would have been their future you know 10 15 mm. years from now they're experiencing it faster now mm. and so we're left with that state of okay we really need to evaluate what is the Christian faith all about? And what is discipleship? What does it mean to be a community of believers and grow together? What does that look like? And so for me personally, I think that, there we go, right? <laughs> You're getting excited, aren't you? There we go. That's yeah. about as close to an amen as we're going to get in the Presbyterian <laughs> Church. It's just a little, a little bit. There we go. <laughs> um, but it is, I think that we're going to start seeing churches that mm. are they're at a, that tipping point, uh, the make or break point. If, yeah. if we're going to embrace what does this discipleship look like, how do we engage in those mm. relationships more? I mean, I mean, I've heard of some, some churches doing um, directory roulette. And so every day they will, they will just flip through the, the church directory, point their finger down, and whoever they land on, they call that person, like cold call. And and just seek to engage in some kind of relationship to keep this, because they recognize that I'm not seeing these people on Sunday mornings anymore. I'm not having these regular opportunities. Mm. I, I actually have to own up my responsibility to engaging in these relationships. And so I'm going to 
and, and, and th these are probably extroverts. The introverts are cringing right now, but sure. you know, like yeah. that, there's an intentionality behind that, yeah. right? Of yeah. just trying to stay in those kind of relationships. Yeah. Awesome, so, awesome. Yeah. Curtis, last thing, I, I yeah. just I, um, first year of the pandemic, primarily, we we were kind of interviewing a number of people, and I always ended up by just saying, okay. Have you got something to share with us in terms of a, a verse or something on your heart that you just want to kind of say to us? I know um, that's a dangerous thing for you because we could be here for 20 <laughs> minutes, but uh, uh, yeah. over to you. Is there a verse yeah. or something you want to share with us? Yeah, so I've, I've been living in the Psalms lately because um, it's, I mean, it's just so rich. It's the, the prayer book of the Bible. Um, and so Psalm 94, verse 22, I'll stick it to just one verse right now, um, but I am a preacher, so I'll give a bit of context. Uh, the, the psalmist is, is praying about um, being persecuted and having enemies kind of coming around and is praying to God, like, God, you are the great avenger. Will you avenge me in this? And, and so he, he's, he's explaining all these bad things that are happening. The, the wicked are prospering and the righteous are getting um, trampled. And then verse 22 of Psalm 94 says, But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God the rock of my refuge. And I've always been intrigued by that idea of God as a stronghold, as a refuge, as a, a protective castle. Um, but I've never really been able to appreciate the depth of what that solid feeling feels like. I mean, How Firm a Foundation is, a, is one of my favorite hymns. And, and I mean, it's, it's just theologically, it's great, but it, it captures that, that, that solid footing. And I think this pandemic has been something that we've really needed that, that solid footing because our idea of church, our idea of what discipleship looks like, our idea of what worship looks like, especially for those who are tuning in right now in your pajamas and with a coffee, you know, <laughs> praise be to God that you're here. Um, but we've needed that foundation. We've needed that solid footing to know that even though this all looks different, even though we worship with masks, even though we worship with a, with a screen, what holds it all together, what allows us to feel confident in this as an expression of worship is that we all share that, that strong stronghold. Yeah. So. Awesome. It's, been, it's great to see you. I know these are always really short visits and uh, you're transitioning through. It's great to have you all back in BC again. You never know, we'll get you down in around the Vancouver area a little bit more, but um, lovely to see you. Before we invite Elaine up, I think Elaine, you're going to be reading this morning, so uh, let, can I pray for you guys? Yeah, Let's thanks. pray for these guys. Lord, a number of years ago, as a congregation, we had the opportunity to lay hands and to pray over Curtis and Elaine and send them off um, to the east um, on, in, on, on their ministry uh, in Kingston, and you've blessed them incredibly. We're so thankful for that. We're so thankful that you are continuing to call them and uh, use them to do mighty works, mighty deeds uh, in your church as a whole, but primarily now in St. Giles up in Prince George. We pray for them as a family, for little Gemma and Clea, and uh, for number three, um, we are just so thankful um, that you're growing their family and that they're strong and healthy. We just pray for these last couple of months of uh, Elaine's pregnancy that that would go well, because uh, this is uh, a hard time to transition from the East Coast um, back and uh, in the midst of uh, third trimester. So Lord, we just pray for her and we just pray for this family that you would take them and use them in Prince George to work with Al and have um, uh, just incredible ministry um, up there. And to hear Curtis's passion this morning uh, is just such a rich blessing for us to see how you have used him, matured him, um, Lord, and how rooted he is in his faith and how focused he is on keeping you at the center of everything. So we just pray for your grace and to go with them and for your spirit to fill them and breathe life into them and through them as they go and minister in your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. It's great to see you, brother. You are looking incredibly healthy. <sighs> and he eats like a horse, people. He probably... So really does. And uh, Elaine, I'm going to invite you up. You're going to come up and read for us. This morning's 
um, passage is from Isaiah 52, verse 13, to Isaiah 53, verse 12. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled by him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Like all, we, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearer is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks Salim. Well, it's an incredible passage of scripture, and um, the youth band are going to come up again because they've been practicing uh, another new song. I'm going to invite you to stay, remain seated um, during this, and uh, um, if you want to sing along, please uh, do, but this is a song that they've been practicing called You Put Your Love on the Line, a song that I think just really echoes what we've just heard in that incredible passage of scripture.
Well, this Lenten season, we are continuing our journey through George Friedrich Handel's incredible oratorio, Messiah. Messiah is divided into three parts, which could be labeled, I've kind of been labeling them in my notes under the titles, past, present, and future. We focused on part one, the past during last Advent, because it basically focuses on what led up the history behind the coming and the birth of the Messiah in the world. And during Lent, we are largely focusing now on part two of Messiah the present because it focuses on the actual work, the ministry that the Messiah came to do. Part three, the future, 
The result, the outcome of Messiah's work, well, we're going to wrap the whole of part three into one day, Easter Sunday. Last Sunday, we looked at the very first piece in part two, entitled, Behold the Lamb. And hopefully you'll remember, I argue that this piece kind of acts a bit like a prologue, a kind of umbrella that overarches everything that follows in part two, up to the finale of part two, a piece of music you know very well, a piece of music we will get to on Good Friday called Hallelujah. Part two begins where part one of Messiah left us with a thought-provoking piece somber in feel as it should be. The words are very simple. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When the Apostle John uses this phrase, sin of the world, he's not merely thinking about an unending list of things that you and I do wrong. He sees the sin of the world as the way to describe the consequences for humanity turning its back on God's design for the entire world. Humanity, all of us, have separated ourselves from God. Think about it like this. John's gospel opens up with the words, in the beginning. Where else do we hear that phrase in Scripture? Yeah, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning of the Scripture. In the beginning, God created everything. In the beginning, God called it good. In fact, when he created you and I, when he creates humanity, he calls it very good. And you ask the question, why did he call it very good? What made humanity any different than the rest of the entire created order? Because it was the only thing created from within the relationship that God himself exists in, that he has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Humanity was created in God's image, out of that intimate relationship. And what's more, humanity is called very good because we were created to live in those intimate relationships. Humanity was created to be in relationship with God. Hence, at the very beginning, we see humanity and God walking together in the garden, living, thriving with each other. In the beginning, that's what God created. Humanity, living, thriving, in and out of God's very life, His breath. But what happened? Part one of the Messiah has been reminding us what the Scriptures in the Old Testament teach us on almost every page. Humanity has broken itself away from God, broken from each other, broken away from God, turned its back away from God's life. And that theme is picked up again in the very next choral piece that I want to share with you this morning, a piece of music that Owen is now going to share with us.
Okay, so let me ask us all a question. If I had given absolutely no introduction today and just started the sermon by playing that piece to you, what would your reaction to it have been? Or at least the first three quarters of it. How would you describe that piece of music? It's quite light. It's almost fun. It's kind of jovial. Can you picture, uh, if you kind of close your eyes, little fluffy white lambs skipping and bouncing around lush green pastures, all running in their own direction almost playfully? This piece of music stands in stark contrast to the seriousness of the solemn prologue we played last week that is at the, the beginning of part two. It appears almost out of place. It's almost confusing. Could a criticism now be directed towards George Friedrich Handel, but for composing something apparently so trivial, given the subject matter that overarches this song, the iniquity of us all, the sin of the world? Well, I'm not suggesting we criticize Handel at all. I hope we will see his genius. To understand this piece of music, we need to keep it in the context of the other pieces in Messiah and, of course, the Scripture that Elaine read for us earlier. So let's begin by taking a brief look at the Scripture text itself. Owen's going to share a couple of slides as we make our way through this so you can actually see uh, what uh, this looks like. So let's set the context. Messiah began... As you recall, quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 5. That's where this whole thing started. That begins, comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Messiah begins because the world needs restoration. And God speaks to the world, to all of us, and says, be comforted, my people. I am going to do this. I'm going to do this restoration. So the question is, how? Well, then, Isaiah 42, we get the first of what scholars call the four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. Four scripture passages that talk about a servant of the Lord who's going to come and bring this much-needed comfort to the world. I'm just going to list the four servant songs for you. It begins, number one, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. The calling of the servant himself. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to to all the nations. Then the second song is Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 to 13. The commission of the servant. Now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be a servant, he says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up merely the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light as a light to all nations that my salvation may reach to the very ends of the earth. The commission to the entire world. All people. The third song is Isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 to 11. The commitment of the servant himself. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. The servant's all in to this. He will give himself fully to the task ahead of him. And the fourth and final servant song is the passage that Elaine read for us. Isaiah 52, verses th- from Isaiah 52, verse 13, all the way to 53, verse 12. The career of the servant, you might call it. The actual work the Messiah has come to do. Now, when Elaine read the passage which she read brilliantly, by the way, I hope you heard that the majority of that passage of the fourth song is focused on the career of the servant, on what the servant will do. And it's not an easy list to listen to. Absolutely it's not. 
In fact, when you look at part two of Messiah, you hear the work of Messiah in no uncertain terms. It's not an easy list to hear. So far, the flow of part two of, the, of Messiah, one more slide, looks like this. The prologue, a chorus piece, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Then there's a soloist, an aria, who sings, he was despised. Despised. And then three chorus pieces in a row. The first, surely he hath borne our grief. Immediately they break into the next song and with his stripes. And immediately after that, the piece we heard this morning, all we like sheep. Now we'll just keep that final slide up for a moment or two, um, Owen. The aria that follows the prologue, sung by a soloist, is in fact the longest by far in the whole of Messiah. It's almost 10 minutes long. A slow, serious piece reflecting on the shocking treatment of Messiah by humanity. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. One voice singing for all of humanity, and as we hear over and over and over and over again about humanity's rejection of the Messiah, you and I, through this 10 minutes of this solo, are drawn into it. You and I, we're the ones singing it. We're the ones responsible for it. Then the chorus stands and sings two very strong, forceful pieces that kind of punch you in the face in some ways. It's like we are stood before a mirror of our lives and we have to gaze over the whole thing. We have to see our own finger of judgment pointing directly at us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The more you hear these pieces, the more I get the sense that I want to look away, or at least, the very least, close my eyes. I don't want to have to look at myself, let alone look into the face of the Messiah and have to realize what he did because of me. Through the aria and the first two chorus pieces, there's a weightiness of the Messiah's burden that we have to come to terms with. The same weightiness that took us into the interval after part one. All of this is because of us, because of you, because of me. And then after hearing the aria and those first two choruses, when we're feeling this heavy reality about the work of Messiah, because of our failures, the chorus breaks into its third piece. The piece you've just listened to. All we like sheep have gone astray. And on and on and on. It's kind of a bit out of place. Fine. In fact, it's hard to sing it with a kind of smile on your face. The song itself almost comes a bit like a, like a relief on the journey. It's like a cold towel has been wrapped around your neck on a warm, sunny day. It's almost refreshing in a sense. What's going on? Why would Handel be so casual, apparently, with this piece of music? Why not keep the serious tone of the servant song from Isaiah 53? Okay, Owen, you can stop sharing the slides now. Hopefully you'll remember, I've mentioned a few times through this journey in Advent and also from last week, Charles Jennings, who put together the libretto, the lyrics for Messiah, wanted Handel to put his whole genius into this composition. All of it. Yet again, what Handel has done in this piece of music, in my humble opinion, 
a sheer genius. Why? Listening to the aria and the first two choral pieces that, pr that precede all we like sheep, it would appear that we are brought face to face with our sinfulness. We see each of us as sinners in the mirror. We see ourselves responsible for the inhumane treatment of the Messiah. We become aware of who we are. Yeah, we do. Then the genius of Handel kicks in. Because that's not the reality of humanity at all. You see, for the most part, humanity, you and me, are like sheep. Playing in a field. Wandering around with no idea how we got there. Where we're going. Or how we're going to get to where we are going. Handel's light-hearted composition reflects the fact we are, for the most part, silly little sheep, oblivious to the real reality of our lives. In the right sense of the word, we are ignorant to the fact that we have indeed turned to our own ways and that we are indeed separated from the living God ignorant to the fact that we are wandering all over a countryside, doing our own thing, living our lives in accordance to our own desires. Oblivious to the fact that the Messiah shows up, and as we heard so dramatically in the music, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Messiah, the servant, called, commissioned, committed, and he accomplishes his work without any realization on the part of the sheep whatsoever. We continue to be little sheep on the hillside. So let me ask two things then. What does Messiah do? What do we learn about the work of Messiah in these opening pieces in part two? What do we learn about what Messiah has done through the servant songs? And once we know that, does it change anything in terms of the lives of the sheep? Okay, what did he do? Remember last week I used the image of a chasm between us and God, well, us on kind of one side. Uh, we might write the words God, um, God and life on one side of the chasm, and on the other we might say humanity and death. That's kind of a summary of what we were looking at last week. Not as a judgment per se, but it's just a fact. Being separated from the God of life will ultimately lead humanity to no other place but death, because we are incapable of altering that reality on our own. Messiah shows up. What does he do? He restores the chasm, so to speak. The prologue said it. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I introduced this idea last week that takes away really means remove remove the chasm, so to speak, remove and restore the connection that lies between God and humanity. So I want to take a little more time, a little few minutes today, and see how this relates, all of this, to the dramatic conclusion to the choral piece taken from the fourth servant song this morning, where we get this idea that the Lord hath laid upon him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. In the scriptures of the Old Testament, there was a special day that symbolized this ultimate restoration, healing of the entire world. It's called the Day of Atonement. On that day, something was done in the midst of all the people that symbolized how the restoration of all peoples to God 
would happen. So let me read that for you. It's taken from Leviticus chapter 16, reading from verse 7. The high priest, Aaron, in that case, would have two goats or rams presented to him, and he would bring them before the Holy of Holies, before God. Now, I know that Leviticus here is talking about two goats or rams, but I submit to you that when the apostle John writes about the Lamb of God in his gospel, and when we hear about the the Lamb of God being sung in Messiah, it's combining all of this work, the work of being the Lamb of God, and indeed what's happening to the goats on the Day Day of Atonement. Let me unpack that for you. So the two goats are brought before the priest, and then reading from verse 8, then he shall take, the priest shall take the two goats, set them before the Lord, before the Lord God, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, right? One lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Now Aaron casts lots. In other words, he doesn't make the choice of which goat goes to whom. He's relying on God to cast the lots for God to make his choice. Now, the Day of Atonement does not then rest upon the actions of any human being, any priest. What happens on the Day of Atonement is the start of it and all of it flows from the will and the decision and the choice and the actions of the living God. Here's what happens. The two goats are before the lots are cast. We get told one is sacrificed exactly the way the Passover lamb was sacrificed to represent, this first goat represents that that goat takes upon itself the curse of death. As we saw last week, if the lamb takes death upon itself, it leaves life behind. We looked at that when the lamb's blood was smeared on the entrance to the houses that protected those inside from death, death touch. It gives them life, in other words. The second goat chosen by law, chosen by the will of God, is to be for, in the scriptures, this person Azazel. Who on earth is that? It's just a compound Hebrew word that literally means complete removal. The other goat is to symbolize complete removal. What does that mean? Verse 9, And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering, But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel, complete removal, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to complete removal. Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of this live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the people of God, all of their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put all of that upon the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities upon itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness." Aaron transfers all the sin onto the goat. The goat is then sent to Azazel, sent off to complete removal, and in doing so, takes away the sin of the world. This is what the Lamb of God does. This is what Messiah came to do. To do both aspects of this work. The lamb sacrificed to protect the people from death, leaving behind life. And he does this 
because he is the one upon whom all sin is transferred. And he takes it to a place called complete removal. That's what these opening pieces in part two of the Messiah singing out of the fourth servant song. That's what they're teaching us. So, we, like sheep, are wandering around on the hillside playfully. Once we learn that Messiah has done this, what then? Once we get to the end of this piece of music, does it change our response as sheep? At some point, we have to come to terms with the fact that we live our lives like silly little sheep, wandering in the wilderness aimlessly, without purpose, without direction, without hope of life. Because we're living on one side of the great chasm. At that moment of realization, we have to come face to face with our sin and the career of the Messiah, the actions of the Lamb of God, what he did for every single sheep. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of all of us. And he has removed the chasm. He has removed it completely. There is now no real separation between ourselves and God, between ourselves and life, the life that God wants for us, that we were created to have, that we were created out of. So what do we do now as those sheep? Do we continue to live in the, well, in the wilderness, on the hillside, play, playfully wandering, bouncing aimlessly? Or do we stop? Do we now return to the living God and give up our lives a sheep. Let's pray. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, turned each one to our own way. The Lord hath laid upon the Messiah the iniquity of us all. Amen. Please stand as we worship once more.
we praise you this day for who you are and for what you've done for us. What a privilege it is for us to journey through another Lenten season, to truly have our eyes opened, our ears alert, our lives just yearning for more of your life. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to be here for those in their worship spaces at home. And we pray now by your mercy and grace, by the power of your spirit moving, that you will send us out not to be sheep wandering, but you would send us out, as Curtis has reminded us this morning, as your disciples to follow you, to follow your career your work, your calling, your word. May your grace, may your love, may your breath of life go with us, fill us, and overflow out of us this day and always. In the name of the Lord Messiah, we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you all. Stay and have fellowship in this, in this place or out, outside if you want. Say hello to Curtis and Elaine and are fair view folks that I see here uh, th this morning, and we look forward to meeting again uh, next Sunday. God bless you.